same, same place. By Mervyn. And when my mother came through the door and asked me whether I had seen her spectacles, I hated her too. I hated the clothes she wore, tasteless and fuzzy. I hated them deeply. I hated something I had never noticed before. It was the way the heels of her shoes were worn away on their outside edge. Not badly, but appreciably. It looked mean to me, slatternly, and horribly human. I hated her for being human, like father. She began to nag me about her hair glasses and the threadbare conditions of the elbows of my jacket. And suddenly I threw my book down. The room was unbearable. I felt suffocated. I suddenly realized that I must get away. I had lived with these two people for nearly 23 years. I had been born in the room immediately overhead. Was this the life for a young man? To spend his evenings watching the smoke drift out of his father's mouth and stand at that decrepit old mustache year after year. To watch the worn away edges of my mother's heels, the dark brown furniture and the familiar stains on the chocolate colored carpet, I would go away. I would shake off the dark, smug mortality of the place. I would for evil my birthright. What of my father's business into which I would step at his death? What of it? To hell with. I began to make my way to the door. But at the third step, I caught my foot in a rug of the chocolate-colored carpet, and in reaching out my hand for support, I sent in a big face flying. Suddenly, I felt very small and very angry. I saw my mother's mouth opening and reminded me of the front of the door, and the front door reminded me of my urge to escape. To where? To where? I did not wait to find an answer to my own question, but hardly knowing what I was doing, ran from the house. The accumulated boredom of the last 23 years was at my back, and it seemed that I was propelled through the garden gate from its pressure against my shoulder blades. The road was wet with rain, black and shiny like oil skin. The reflection of the street lamps wallowed like yellow jellyfish. A bus was approaching. A bus to Picadi. A bus to the never, never land. A bus to death or glory. I found neither. I found something which haunts me still. The great bus swayed as it sped. The black street gleamed. Through the window, a hundred faces fluttered by as though the leaves of a dark book were being flicked over. And I sat there, with a six-penny ticket in my hand. What was I doing? Where was I going? To the end of the world, I told myself. To Piccadilly Circus, where anything might happen. What did I want to happen? I wanted life to happen. I wanted adventure. But already I was afraid. I wanted to find a beautiful woman. Bending my elbow, I felt for the swelling of my biceps. There wasn't much to feel. Oh hell, I said to myself. Oh damnable hell, this is awful. I stared out of the window, and there before me was the circus. The lights were like a challenge. When the bus had curved its way from Regent Street and into Shaftesbury Avenue, I alighted. Here was the jungle all about me, and I was lonely. The wild beasts brawled around me. The wolf packed, surged and shuffled. Where was I to go? How wonderful it would have been to have known of some apartment, thinly lighted of a door that opened to the secret knob. Three short ones and one long one. Where a strawberry blonde was waiting, or perhaps, better still, some wise old lady with a cup of tea. An old lady. August and hollow, and whose heels were not worn down on their outside edges. But I knew nowhere to go either for glamour or sympathy. Nowhere except the corner house. I made my way there. It was less congested than usual. I had only to cool for a few minutes before being allowed into the great eating palace on the first floor. On the marble of gold of it all. 
the waiters coming and going, the bend in the distance, how different all this was from an hour ago when I stared at my father's moustache. For some while I could find no table, and it was only when moving down to the third of the long corridors between tables that I saw an old man leaving a table for two. The lady, who had been sitting opposite him, remained where she was. Had she left, I would have no tale to tell. Unsuspectedly, I took the place of the old man and in reaching for the menu lifted my head and found myself gazing to the midnight pools of her eyes. My hand hung poised over the, the menu. I could not move, for the head in front of me was magnificent. It was big and pale and indescribably proud, and what I would now call a greedy look seemed to me then to be an expression of rich assurance, of majestic beauty. I knew at once that it was not the strawberry blonde of my callow fancy that I desired for glamour's sake, nor the comfort of the tea tray lady, but this glorious creature before me who combined the mystery and exorcities of the former with the latter's mellow wisdom. Was this not love at first sight? Why else should my heart have hammered like a foundry? Why should my hand have trembled above the menu? Why should my mouth have gone dry? Words were quite impossible. It was clear to me that she knew everything that was going on in my breast and in my brain. The look of love which fluted from her eyes all but unhinged me. Taking my hand in hers, she returned it to my side of the table where it lay like a dead thing on a plate. Then she passed me the menu. It meant nothing to me. The horse d'ouvre and the sweets were all mixed together in a dance of letters. What I told the waiter when he came, I cannot remember, nor what he brought me. I know that I could not eat it. For an hour we sat there. We spoke with our eyes, with the pulse and stress of our excited breathing. And towards the end of this, our first meeting, with the tips of our fingers that in touching each other in the shadow of the teapot, seemed to speak a language richer, subtler, and more vibrant than words. At last we were asked to go, and as I rose I spoke for the first time. Tomorrow? I whispered. Tomorrow? She nodded her magnificent head slowly. Same place? Same time? She nodded again. I waited for her to rise. But with a gentle yet authoritative gesture, she signed led me away. It seemed strange, but I knew I must go. I turned at the door and saw her sitting there, very still, very upright. Then I descended to the street and made my way to Shakespeare Avenue, my head in a reel of stars, my legs weak and trembling, my heart on fire. I had not decided to return home, but found nevertheless that I was on my way back. Back to the chocolate-colored carpet, to my father in the ugly armchair, to my mother with her worn shoe heels. When at last I turned the key, it was near my midnight. My mother had been crying. My father was angry. There were words, threats and entreaties on all sides. At last, I got to the bed. The next day seemed endless, but at long last my excited friend found some relief in action. Soon after tea, I boarded the westbound bus. It was already dark, but I was too far early when I arrived at the circle. I wandered restlessly, here and there adjusting my tie at shop windows and feeling my nails for the hundredth time. At last, when waking from a daydream as I sat for the fifth time in Le Leicester Square, I glanced at my watch and finally I was three minutes late for our trust. I ran all the way panting with anxiety, but when I arrived at the table on the first floor, I found my fear was baseless. She was there more regal than ever, a monument of womanhood. 
Her large, pale face relaxed into an expression of such deep pleasure at the sight of me that I almost shouted for joy. I will not speak of the tenderness of that evening. It was magic. It is enough to say that we determined that our destinies were inextricably joined. When the time came for us to go, I was surprised to find that the procedure of the previous night was once more expected of me. I could in no way make out the reason for it. Again, I left her sitting alone at the table but the marble pillar. Again, I vanished into the night alone with those intoxicating words still on my lips. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Same time. Same place. The certainty of my love for her and hers for me was quite intoxicating. I slept little that night and my restlessness on the following day was an agony both for me and my parents. Before I left that night for our third meeting, I crept into my mother's bedroom and opening her a jewel box, I chose a ring from among her few trinkets. God knows it was not worth it to sit upon my loved one's finger, but it would symbolize our love. Again she was waiting for me, though on this occasion I arrived a full quarter of an hour before our appointed time. It was as though, when we were together, we were hidden in a view of love, as though we were alone. We heard nothing else but the sound of our voice. We saw nothing else but one another's eyes. She put the ring upon her fingers as soon as I had given it to her. Her hand that was holding mine tightened its grip. I was surprised at, it, at its power. My whole body trembled. I moved my foot beneath the table to touch hers. I could find it nowhere. When once more the dreaded moment arrived, I felt her sitting upright the strong and tender smile of her farewell remaining in my mind like some fantastic sunrise. For eight days we met thus and parted thus, and with every meeting we knew more firmly than ever that whatever the difficulties that would result, whatever the force against us, yet it was now that we must marry now. A while the magic was upon us. On the eighth evening it was all decided. She knew that for my part it must be a secret wedding. My parents would never contain so rapid an arrangement. She understood perfectly. For part she wished a few of her friends to be present at the ceremony. I have a few colleagues, she had said. I did not know what she meant but her instructions as to where we should meet on the following afternoon put the remark out of my mind. There was a registry office in Cambridge Circles, she told me, on the first floor of a certain building. I was to be there at four o'clock. She would arrange everything. Ah, my love, she had murmured, shaking her large head slowly from side to side how can I wait until then? And with a smile unutterably bewitching, she gestured for me to go, for the great marmoreal hall was all but empty. For the eighth time, I left her there. I knew that women must have their secrets and must be in no way tortured in regard to them. And so, once again, I swallowed the question that I so longed to put to her. Why? Oh, why had I always to leave her there? And why, when I arrived to meet her, was she always there to meet me? On the following day, after a careful search, I found a gold ring in a box in my father's dressing room. Soon after three, having brushed my hair until it shone like seal skin, I set forth with a flower in my buttonhole and suitcase of belongings. It was a beautiful day with no wind and a clear sky. The bus fled on like a fabulous beast, bearing me with into a magic land. 
but alas, as we approached Mayfair, we were held up more than once for long stretches of time. I began to get restless. By the time the bus had reached Shaftesbury Avenue, I had but three minutes in which to reach the office. It seemed strange that when the sunlight shone in my sympathy with my marriage, the traffic should choose to frustrate me. I was on the top of the bus and having been given a very clear description of the building, was able as we rounded at last into Cambridge Circus to recognize it at once. When we came alongside my destination, the traffic was held up again and I was offered the perfect opportunity of disembarking immediately beneath the building. My suitcase was at my feet, and as I stooped to pick it up, I glanced at the windows on the first floor, for it was in one of those rooms that I was so soon to become a husband. I was exactly on a level with the windows in question and commanded an unbroken view of the interior of a first floor room. It could not have been more than a dozen feet away from where I sat. I remember that our bus was hooting away, but there was no movement in the traffic ahead. The hooting came to me as through a dream, for I had become lost in another world. My hand was clenched upon the handle of the suitcase. Through my eyes and into my brain, an image was pouring the image of the first floor room. I knew at once that it was in the particular room that I was expected. I cannot tell you why, for during those first few moments I had not seen her. To the right of the stage, for I had the sensation of being in a theater, was a table loaded with flowers. Behind the flowers sat a small pinster register. There were four others in the room, three of whom kept walking to and fro. The fourth, an enormous bearded lady, sat on a chair by the window. As I stared, one of the men bent over to speak to her. He had the longest neck on earth. His starched collar was the length of a walking stick, and his small bony head prodded from its extremity like the school of a bird. The other two gentlemen who kept crossing and recrossing were very different. One was bald. His face and cranium were blue with the most intricate tattooing. His teeth were gold and they shone like fire in his mouth. The other was a well-dressed young man and seemed normal enough until, as he came for a moment closer to the window, I saw that instead of a hand, the cloven hoof of a goat prodded from the left sleeve. And then suddenly it all happened. A door of their room must have opened, for all at once all the heads in the room were turned in one direction, and a moment later something white trotted like a dog across the room. But it was no dog, it was very cold as it rained. I thought at first that it was a mechanical doll, so close was it to the floor. I could not observe its face, but I was amazed to see the long train of setting that was being dragged along the carpet behind it. It stopped when it reached the flower-laden table, and there was a good deal of smiling and bowing. And then the man with the longest neck in the road placed a high stool in front of the table and, with the help of the young man with the gold foot, lifted the white thing so that it stood upon the high stool. The long setting dress was carefully draped over the stool so that it reached the floor on every side. It seemed as though a tall, defined woman was standing at the civic altar, and still I had not seen its face, though I knew what it it would be like. A sense of nausea overheld me and I sank back on the seat, hiding my face in my hands. I cannot remember when the bus began to move. 
I know that I went on and on and on and that finally I was told that I had, had reached the terminus. There was nothing for it but to board another bus of the same number and make the return journey. A strange sense of relief had by now begun to blunt the edge of my disappointment. That this bus would take me to the door of the house where I was born gave me a twinge of homesick pleasure, but stronger was my sense of fear. I prayed that there would be no reason for the bus to be held up again in Cambridge Circus. I had taken one of the downstairs seats, for I had no wish to be on eye level with someone I had deserted. I had no sense of having wronged her, but she had been deserted nevertheless. When at last the bus approached the circus, I peered into the half-darkness. A street lamp stood immediately below the register office. I saw at once that there was no light in the office, and as the bus moved past, I turned my eyes to a group beneath the street lamp. My heart went cold in my breast. Standing there, ossified as it were into a magnilant mass, standing there as though they never intended to move until justice was done, were the five. It was only for a second that I saw them, but every lamplit head is forever with me. The long-necked man with his bird's cold head, his eyes glittering like chips of glass, to his right the small bald man, his tattooed scalp thrust forward, the lamplight glittering on the blue markings. To the left of the long-necked man stood the youth, his elegant body relaxed but a snore on his face that I still sweat to remember. His hands were in his pockets, but I could see the shape of the hoof through the cloth. A little ahead of this tree stood the bearded lady, a book of evil, and in the shadow that she cast before her I saw in that last fraction of a second. As the bus rolled me past, a big reddish head very close to the ground. In the dusk, it appeared to be suspended above the curb like a pale balloon with a red mouth painted upon it. A mouth that, taking a single diabolical curve, was more like the mouth of a wild beast than of a woman. Long after I had left the group behind me, sad as it were, for, forever under the lamp, like something made of wax, like something monstrous, long after I had left it I yet saw it all. It filled the bus. They filled my brain. They feel as it is still. When at last I arrived home, I fell weeping upon my bed. My father and mother had no idea what it was all about. But they did not ask me. They never asked me. That evening, after supper, I sat there. I remember six years ago in my own chair on the chocolate-colored carpet. I remember how I stared with love at the ash of my father's waistcoat, at his stained mustache, at my mother's worn-away shoe heels. I stared at it all and I love it all. I needed it all. Since then, I have never left the house. I know what is best for me. same place, the author suggests that the main character has a Oedipus complex and a rivalry toward his father. Oedipus complex is a psychoanalytic theory created by Sigmund Freud. It suggests that a boy on his development stage has unconscious sexual desire for the parent of the opposite sex, mother and jealously aims and sense of rivalry with the parent of the same sex, father. A boy who wants to compete with his father to get the mother's attention. The kid wants to exclude his father taking his place with his mother. This theory applies on the text when the main character sees his father apparently doing nothing than usual in the living room. The father is sitting on an armchair smoking a cigarette, eyes half-closed, almost sleeping. 
The guy starts to complain about what his father is doing. He hates everything about his, his father, his smell, his mustache, his relaxed moment, even the smoke of his cigarette. He wants to run away from his home because he cannot sustain this relationship anymore. He hates his father. He sees his dad almost like an enemy. Moreover, on his unconscious, he thinks that his father is taking, taking his place. He believes that he is not enough to, for his mother and asks himself what his father has that he does not have. Later on the story, the main character runs away from his house with no destination. He walks during the night. The road is wet with the rain and he does not know where he's going. He seems lost. He sees a bus approaching. This bus goes to Piccadilly Circus. He believes that there is a good place to go. During the ride, he feels lonely and wish a company to himself, someone to go on an ad adventure with him. First, he desires a blonde girl waiting for him, but he has a better idea, a, wi a wise old lady with a cup of tea. The main character sees this wise old lady as a figure of his mother. He feels lonely and wants a company. He cannot be with his mother, so he desires someone with the features that he has expected and missed it on his mom. The main character also makes a comparison saying that he expects the wise old lady has different shoes than his mom. One more time show us how this woman represents his mom. When he says about his shoes it shows something sexual but for psychoanalysis sexual is not related with the sexual desire in adults. It is related to affection, the desire to be sufficient for his mom. This can be the reason that makes him run away from his home.